with American Eel once everybody is seated. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the uh, EEL board meeting for the summer meeting. Um, the agenda for the EEL meeting, everybody has that. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Everybody has the chance to look at the proceedings from the January 2017 meeting. Are there any changes to that? Seeing none, the proceedings are approved. And now we move on to item three, public comment. Uh, we have one person who has signed up, Jeff Pierce. Good morning again, Chairman Clark and distinguished members of the American Eel Board. My name is Jeffrey Pierce. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Alva Fishermen's Association and thank you for allowing me to make public comment. First, I would like to comment on the positive things that have been going on in the state of Maine's glass eel fishery. As many of you know, in 2011 and 12, Maine's glass eel fishery had a serious uh, problem with poaching. Maine Department of Marine Resources, in conjunction with the Maine Marine Patrol, Maine Warden Service, and the Maine State Police Sheriff and Alva Fishermen worked diligently to correct and stamp out poaching with the aid and issuance of the first ever swipe card system, which was able to account for every eel harvested. This was instrumental in compiling harvested data. The following season, because of the new quota implemented, Maine went to an individual quota system, again, the first on the eastern seaboard. With the swipe card, in the IQS, every harvester was able to manage their quota to ensure compliance with the new co quota imposed by this board. The co uh, the, to the comments to, the, uh, to commit to the best management of the glass eel fishery, the Maine Department of Marine Resources, the Maine Alva Fishermen Association worked with the state legislature to enact an export license to close the loop on poaching. Now, every glass eel in Maine is tracked from harvester to dealer to exporter to its final destination. Maine, like many states, have been working on habitat restoration, fish passage, and in some cases, dam removal. For example, Maine have removed several large dams in recent years, resulting in the opening of over, a thousand, over thousands of acres of habitat. Maine glass eel fishery starts March 22nd. Most fishermen start catching elvers by the first week in April. Even last year's harsh winter, in the last uh, two years, 80% of Maine's glacial quota has been caught by the first week in May. The season ends June 7th. The yellow wheel fishery south of Maine has been doing extremely well, with a number of states exceeding their quota allocated by Addendum 4. These are just a few reasons why we hope this board would consider new quota allocations or an addendum if needed for the yellow and glass eel fishery for the upcoming season. Thank you, and I'd happily answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Pat Keller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to this point, but I, there was another individual from Maine um, who was supposed to be here, uh, and since we started early, she she may just be running late. Um, uh, her intent was uh, under public comment to talk about um, possible glass seal quota for aquaculture in the state of Maine, but I uh, just wanted to preserve her ability to speak uh, later in the meeting if she does come. Got it. Maybe we can put her down under other business at the, toward the end of the meeting. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move on to item number four, and that is to consider the North Carolina Glass Eel Aquaculture Plan for 2018. It's an action item. Uh, 
going to turn it over to Kirby, and we'll have reports from the Technical Committee and the Law Enforcement Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to uh, walk you all through the aquaculture plan that North Carolina uh, has submitted, and specifically the revised plan. There were two versions of it, one that was submitted in June and one that was submitted um, last week. So I'm going to try to make note of where those changes are. Um, and I also, I've also asked uh, Dr. Duvall to be ready to answer any additional questions if, if I'm not able to answer them regarding the plan. So. Um, just in terms of an outline, I'm going to give you all a little bit of background on the, the plan process, how it's worked in, the, in recent years, uh, the 2017 season results, the proposed plan for 2018 and beyond, highlight these changes as I said and try to answer your questions. So North Carolina aquaculture plans for the American eel farm have been submitted in 2015 and 2016 previously. Both were reviewed by the technical committee, as you are all aware, um, with recommended changes, and both were approved by the board. Uh, North Carolina submitted a new plan this year for 2018 and beyond on June 1st. Uh, in July of this year, uh, the technical committee reviewed uh, that plan as well as the 2017 results um, and uh, made recommendations. The, North Carolina, in turn, then submitted a revised version of the plan that was uh, seeking to address some of those recommended changes. Um, and those, that revised plan was submitted on the same day that the Law Enforcement Committee uh, reviewed the plan. So I tried to provide that information to the, um, to the LEC members. Uh, Dr. Duvall was also on that call as well to help highlight any changes that there was any confusion on. So. So in terms of this year's season results, um, 12 out of 17 weeks, uh, fike nets were deployed. Fike nets were fished 44 out of 85 available days. There was no fishing on Saturday or Sundays. Um, and a majority of the fishing effort took place in the White Oak River. Um, in total, 775 glass eels, which is approximately a quarter of a pound, were harvested. Uh, 51 glass eels were released live and 23 elvers were captured and released. Uh, in turn, there is approximately 199.74 pounds left of the quota that uh, North Carolina has under the aquaculture plan. Um, also to note uh, were some violations that occurred um, through the efforts to capture uh, glass eels. So I'm gonna lay out uh, two different sets of citations, and I will just preface it by saying that hearings have not occurred for any of the above violations, so the legal outcome is still unknown. Um, but the first was on January 21st. There was a, a citation for using a stationary net to block more than two-thirds of the waterway. That's a rule violation. Um, in March and April, there was um, citations for violating the conditions of the aquaculture plan for not fishing gear within the approved time frame. Uh, as you may remember, there was specifications in the aquaculture plan for fishing two hours after f sunrise without a rigid, uh, they were supposed to have a rigid device in there to keep the net open. It was uh, placed without that device in there. Um, then there were citations uh, issued by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Uh, three of them occurred, all three of those occurred in March. Um, the first was operating a motor vehicle without a proper navigation lights. That's a rule violation. There was operating motor vehicle, or the, the motor vessel with uh, invalid registration number. And then the last was uh, being charged with taking eels by method other than hook and line from inland waters of North Carolina rule and permit violation. So uh, that last one, just to note, that was with regards to where that fishing was occurring relative to um, the approved site. So. All right, so I'm going to go through the proposed changes for 2018 and beyond. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive table, so please bear with me. I will point out that this table was included in materials that were submitted to the board for review. Um, specifically, they're in the memo uh, from, it's uh, dated July 3rd uh, from Todd Mathis to the ASMFC American Eel TC. So, um, in going through this, the change in the, in the plan are as follows. The dates of harvest, um, comparing 2016 to 2017, uh, the new plan extends the season by one month. The duration of the plan, 
um, comparing 2016 to 2017 was extended from one years or one year, excuse me, to two years. Um, regarding the method of harvest, uh, they've requested to add an additional piece of equipment, an L um, Irish eel ladder in, uh, in addition to the fike and dip nets that they used in 2016. Um, there is also a request to change in the location of the harvest. So in 2016, there were 11 primary sites that were largely in creeks and rivers um, within the White Oak uh, River, um, as well as part of the North River. Um, in, in 2017, uh, those creeks and rivers have been replaced with sounds and associated tributaries. And those sounds are the Albemarle Sound, the Pamlico Sound, the Newport River, and uh, the North River. In terms of monitoring program changes, uh, the plan this year is requesting to increase the number of harvesters from one to three, um, and in turn also having two mates for each of those harvesters, so that increases it um, times three essentially uh, from what, what the plan had in place in 2016. Um, regarding the pieces of equipment, it increases it uh, from 15 pieces to 30, that's mostly to align with the increase in the number of harvesters. Regarding the time of year harvest specifications, um, the previous plan had, had laid out that um, in 2017 they had to harvest between January 1st and, and February 28th. Um, this extends in the plan they submitted this year, uh, they, they extend that period by an additional three months. Um, Getting down to the, the actual harvest specifications, there was previously a number of requirements regarding when nets could be set, um, how often they could be fished. So in 2016, fike nets needed to be fished once every 24 hours. Uh, between March 1st through April 30th, fike and dip nets may only be fished and caught ends closed from two hours before sunset to two hours after sunrise. And the tamper evident tags needed to be used to secure the caught ends of the gear, both when it was being used and fished and also when it was being stored. Um, the 2017 plan, the one that the North Carolina submitted this year for 2018 and beyond, removes those requirements. Um, the requirement is removed for fishing it once every 24 hours. Um, they also have changed, so they no longer require removing the nets from the water during weekend periods, um, and the tamper evident tags have been removed as a requirement as well. Um, in terms of some of the specifications during har harvest or before harvest, those have also been uh, changed. There was the previous specification they had to provide the GPS coordinates uh, once the, the nets were set. Uh, that now would be reported after the harvest took place and only once nets have been removed and or moved to another site. Uh, daily reporting of individuals involved in the info on the number of boats and registration and number of vehicles and license plates. Instead of that information being um, provided before every time they went out and, and tried to set the nets, that is being provided at the beginning of the season. So it's only one time at, at the beginning of the season that they have to report this information. During harvest, um, some of the changes are they had to uh, record weight of elvers captured by each piece of uh, equipment. They are moving to uh, waive that requirement um, in the plan moving forward. Um, and initially, there was a request to take out the CPUE data collection that was a component of the plan. Um, the revised version that we received on July 25th added that back in, so there's no uh, change there. Um, so this is the last uh, table in terms of changes to the, the plan um, for after harvest. Uh, previously, they required to call into North Carolina DMF of the total harvest uh, prior to leaving the last harvest site and report the estimated time of arrival when they were going to get back to the, the landing site. Um, and once all gear was fished, they must travel like directly to the, the landing site. Um, and, at the, and once at the landing site, all eels must be offloaded and transported directly to the American Eel Farm facility. Uh, those requirements have been um, uh, waived in this new version of the plan in part uh, because of the increase in the area that they are seeking to fish. Uh, so they pointed out that the time to drive from setting the nets 
um, harvest and getting back to the facility would be too long of a distance, uh, too far of a distance, excuse me, to, to travel, and that's why they are seeking to waive that. Um, and the last change is requiring um, them to report by noon of the, of the following day after they have completed harvest. Uh, that's been shifted up from uh, noon to 5 p.m. the following day. So I went through that pretty quickly, but I'm happy to go back through and answer any questions folks have or revisit any of those changes. We'll take questions on our way from the technical committee. I'm happy to take any questions about the plan now, and then we can get into the technical committee report. Okay, do we have questions for Kirby? And again, just questions. We're not going to discussion right yet. Uh, Dan McKiernan. Thank you. Two questions, Kirby. Um, with the three violations, were those all from one incident? So uh, are you referring to the one from North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission? That's right. Yes, I believe that was all in uh, one day, one instance, okay. um, in March 2017. But Michelle can correct me if I'm if I have that wrong. All right. My second question is, um, what's the rationale for not revealing the information of the net site until after harvest? That's a good question. That's I I, I can't answer that. Michelle, would, could you possibly answer that? Yeah, Kirby, I think it really had more to do with the requirement previously that um, it really had to do more with the requirement previously that those locations were having to be provided every single time the individual called in as opposed to being provided once. So there might be a little bit of misunderstanding or mischaracterization there. Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you may have said it, Kirby, but uh, were all the violations um, from American Eel Farm, or is that other violations? And, and secondly, just a curiosity question, what the hell is an Irish fish ladder? <laughs> okay, so for the first question, um, my understanding they were all the permit holder. Uh, so it was, uh, I believe, Mr. Allen, who uh, the, I, the violations were charged, the citations were charged to, but Michelle can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and then the second question regarding the, uh, the gear, the addition of the new gear, uh, Irish eel ladders are at are usually used at bottleneck points or you know approximately where dams are to help transport eels or use them uh, to collect eels uh, for biological sampling such as young of year surveys. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question concerning the extension of the fishing season. My recollection is that. In our neck of the woods, at least, uh, the, over, or the glacial run is pretty much over by the end of April, and I, I wanted to maybe direct that to Jordy Zimmerman next year, Kirby. Uh, if that's true, uh, and uh, under the assumption that towards the end of the fishing season you get more pigmented eels or elvers, then uh, I'm wondering why they need to extend into the end of May. Jordy, am I right in that? Uh, you're correct in Delaware's Young of the Year Harvest and when we see um, the peak of ingress of glass eels. Um, theoretically, North Carolina should occur a little earlier. Um, I don't recall if we discuss that um, in detail. I would assume that it, that change is just to provide maybe some wiggle room uh, in case we have a particularly cold winter that extends into the spring season. But maybe Dr. Duvall could correct me on that. Dr. Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just a few things. So yes, that, ex that extra month I think was based on conversations that the applicant had had with um, folks in Virginia that indicated that there might be, that there were certainly some years or seasons in which the run extended later into the year. I did just want to mention um, in reference to, to Jim's question about the violations, those were against the American eel farm. So, you know, the eel farm is the permit holder. And then um, one thing, you know, when Kirby was going through the, the table that noted the changes, so I think it's 
and, and noting the, um, the change in the harvest season, I think it was, it's a little bit uh, inaccurate to say that it was an extension of three months. I think it's the way the gear was, was required to be operated changed during January and February. It was required to be operated one way, and then um, during March and April, as Kirby indicated, uh, the gear was required to be removed on the weekends um, and fished a different way. So it's just for this plan, the gear would be allowed to be fished the same way consistently throughout the entire January through May timeframe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Okay, Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, question for Michelle. Um, what permits and licenses does the farm need, and do the violations put any of those in jeopardy? Dr. Duvall. So the farm requires um, an aquaculture operation permit, which they do already have, and then an aquaculture collection permit, which is not um, which is not been issued. This plan would need to be approved prior to issuance of the aquaculture collection permit, and then also a commercial fishing license is required to harvest, as well as a dealer's license to report that harvest. Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, along that line, with the small volume harvested this year, did they go ahead and put those in the tanks to kind of proof the system, or what happened to the, you know, quarter pound harvest this year? Did they buy glass seals to, to start the grow out? So I would have to go back and check with staff in terms of whether additional eel, glass eel purchases were made from either South Carolina or from Maine, but your question is specifically to the eels that were harvested. I don't believe they survived, actually, is my understanding. You know, and any, any harvest that occurs any mortality also counts against that 200 pound allowance. Any for, oh, Cherie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question in regards to the permit violations, and I know that these have not gone to court yet. In uh, the event of a conviction, is there in your rules the removal of the permit option? So even though we approve this options, may it not occur because of a violation? Dr. Duvall? So there is, um, within our rules, there are, and within, um, if there are a certain number of convictions that occur, then just by rule, and this would be for any permit, a permit would not be allowed to be renewed or issued in that case. Okay, seeing no more questions, we'll move on to the technical committee uh, review of this proposal, and that'll be taken by Jordy Zimmerman. Thanks, Jordy. Thank you, John. <clears throat> um, so the American Eel Technical Committee met via conference call on, on July 6. Um, there were a couple of agenda items. Uh, the th first thing we discussed, uh, well, we received an update on, on the crassus, uh, the nematode research uh, from Zoema Warshawski, who is a, a grad student at VIMS, uh, doing some very interesting work there. Um, the North Carolina BMF staff presented the initial uh, North Carolina aquaculture plan. Um, as, as Kirby differentiated the, the initial plan and then the follow-up to that to some of the TC concerns. <clears throat> I'm only going to comment on the initial plan as that's all that has been discussed by the TC as a whole. Uh, there was a progress report on the stock assessment update given uh, by Kristen. Um, Kristen also covered American EO aging project. Uh, we briefly discussed preliminary 2016 yellow eel landings and also briefly discussed the North Carolina Senate Bill 410. Um, for 
the, the purpose of today, um, m most of our discussion centered around the aquaculture plan, and, and that's primarily what, what this presentation will be regarding. So as, as Kirby stated, this is the third year reviewing the North Carolina aquaculture proposals. Um, if you all recall, the initial year was approved by the board uh, too late to be applied um, for the eel farm to actually start fishing. Uh, the second year proceeded under that initial plan proposal that was approved. The TC had a few concerns with this year's uh, proposal, some of which were alleviated through the follow-up. Um, the removal of their monitoring requirements w w was a uh, big issue for the TC, um, and Kirby laid that out in the table, all the changes. There were some statements in the proposal on the justification and the minimal contribution of 200 pounds of glass seals in North Carolina to the coastwide stock. Um, some members of the TC thought this was a little bit misleading with, without any information to say one way or the other if, if that was or was not the case. Um, the expansion of the fishing area from 11 small creeks to larger estuaries, there were a few statements made about uh, the impact this could have on adult eel recruitment from removal of glass eels in, in those estuaries. Um, additional gear types, uh, the Irish eel ramp namely, um, we, we thought that was a little bit odd to include that in the proposal because it's really not conducive, uh, that type of gear to harvest in coastal waters. Um, so in, in summary, the TC did not support the initial plan as laid out to us in, in that call. Uh, we did produce some recommendations. Um, we, we felt that the aquaculture plan should be for one year only, um, especially with, with a lot of unknowns um, still, still kind of occurring. And um, we thought once, once the eel farm comes on board and, and starts having a little bit of success, um, then maybe in future years there, there would be the potential to allow for multiple years uh, so this doesn't come before the board every year. Um, it was requested by several TC members to remove the language on the abundance uh, statement for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, it was somewhat misleading in the eyes of the TC. Um, we also wanted to see the continuance uh, of the requirement for net ID numbers and um, reporting of the gear specifications. And that was simply from a standpoint of if we were going to eventually use this data for an index of glacial recruitment in North Carolina, we would need to standardize that by gear, uh, et cetera. Um, the TC also felt that the fike nets should be fished at least once every 24 hours. Um, this would alleviate the potential unwanted mortality of the target species, glass eels, and also any associated bycatch. North Carolina's uh, TC rep uh, stated that they, they had some issues this year with inclement weather, and um, th that fact could make this requirement difficult um, for that reason. We also were pretty adamant about requiring the catch per unit effort data collection. Um, when we approved the initial plan or when it went through TC review, uh, that was one of the bright spots we saw in it from a uh, scientific standpoint is that we would now have more data from the state of North Carolina um, on young of the year recruitment. And it was, it was also stated uh, the TC fully recognizes that, that the 200 pounds was granted by the board. And um, we, we feel that the expansion of the area and the gear types within reason uh, may be needed, especially in, in light of the results from this, this past year. So as Kirby mentioned, the, uh, there was a revised plan. Um, submitted on July 26, so just, just a week ago. Um, it included 
collection of CPUE data. Um, the gear would continue to be marked with unique ID numbers and uh, the requested time frame was reduced from three years to two years. We have not met again as a technical committee to review this. Um, there was one TC member that had responded via email and they were satisfied with the changes. So with that, I'll open it up to, to any questions. Thanks, Jay-Z. Any questions for the technical committee? Pat Keller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, in, in one of the sections, you talked about the need for um, uh, hauling and checking, back, checking the nets every, within a, once every 24-hour period, but you referenced bycatch. Do the fight nets, are they required to have excluder panels to avoid bycatch? Not that I am aware of. It's part of main regulations to ensure that um, uh, fight nets have excluder panels um, and to help avoid bycatch that might be, it, it doesn't affect the uh, catchability of the net, um, but it's going to keep uh, a lot of unwanted species out, so it may be something that should be required. Thanks, Pat. Any other questions for Jordy? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the Law Enforcement Committee's report. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Duvall. Thanks. Just in reference to Pat's question, um, the, the nets do have excluder panels, so I just wanted to confirm that. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to the Law Enforcement Committee report. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Law Enforcement Committee was asked to review the initial plan, uh, and we were updated on the uh, revised plan. At, on, during our teleconference call of July 25th. And on that call, we also were able to have the uh, input and expertise of uh, North Carolina management as well as lo additional law enforcement staff to answer questions that the law enforcement committee had. Um, after hearing uh, the changes in, in the plan from previous iterations, um, <clears throat> there, were some, there were some reservations expressed uh, about the changes, particularly with regard to both the combination of, well, because of the combination of adding additional uh, very extensive areas over narrow, narrow channel waterways, and in addition to that, the, uh, the reduction in the, the amount of real-time reporting of net activity, netting activity, and, and transportation activity. But because of the uh, input from the staff from North Carolina, uh, the members of the LEC um, really deferred to the expertise and, and the explanations of the North Carolina staff that in this particular case, they were going to be able to have the resources and the, the particularly the enforcement staff on the waters uh, to be able to adequately monitor this, this program uh, and that they were comfortable that, that North Carolina has a very cooperative relationship with the, uh, with the facility and, and is knowledgeable about the harvesters and their activities. Uh, nonetheless, and, and I also failed to mention, we have provided you a written memo of the, trying to summarize the, the LEC comments, and that should be provided, to, has been provided to you, and you can refer to that for more details. Um, but given those reservations, um, because of the confidence that North Carolina can manage this particular permit, um, they cautiously accepted that proposal uh, with the revisions that uh, Kirby uh, provided to us on the day of our conference call. I think the concerns and reservations would, would extend to the point where if, if this were to be a template, for example, for a typical aquaculture program coastwide or in other states, <clears throat> I think the law enforcement committee would have much more serious concerns about the uh, the provisions, particularly where there's a need for more real-time uh, reporting and monitoring of netting activities uh, for this permit, um, and that that's that res reservation and concern is again no in no way reflects on uh, North Carolina's abilities or on the vendor the the facilities uh, uh, abilities to to conduct their activities adequately in this permit, but. Uh, we have a number of states where any harvest of glass seals is illegal. There's a fairly good history, as we all know, in the last few years of substantial 
illegal activity uh, in certain areas. And I think members were concerned that um, if this was, was to become a template for potential aquaculture operations in other states, that we would have to be much more careful about uh, real-time monitoring uh, of activity. Uh, in, in light of that, and again, I would refer you back to our memo, I tried to capture the sense of the LEC. There really wasn't a consensus recommendation um, it, other than an acceptance that North Carolina can, can deal with this permit adequately with their resources. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions for Mark? Lauren? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sir, you just used the term adequately, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, regarding uh, the ways to extract pain uh, for uh, the uh, people who are violating the law, we've, heard, we've spoken of two different uh, things. One would be to simply pull their permit so they're out of business the next year. Uh, secondly, I would assume citations result in fines. Uh, can you comment about uh, the law enforcement uh, committee's expectation that, that uh, the penalties are severe enough that it would cause an inclination to abide by the law in the future? Thank you. We didn't discuss specifically the violations in North Carolina and, and how, uh, how, uh, how those penalties were or how those fines or penalties were imposed. Um, typically, uh, the law enforcement committee uh, would, would, I think, be very supportive. When you have a permit, permits are a very powerful enforcement tool because you can provide very specific conditions and requirements in those permits, including provisions for strict um, enforcement of, of, of any violations and the potential of losing that permit uh, with either one or more violations. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer your question directly. There were some questions asked about those uh, violations that occurred, but again, um, uh, it was felt that uh, it, in part it reflected the ability of the North Carolina law enforcement staff to monitor activity and to make those cases and that that would continue in the future. Do we have any other questions for Mark? Seeing none, uh, at this point, I'd like to recognize Dr. Duvall to state North Carolina's position on this proposal and make a motion to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I provided Kirby with um, a draft motion, if I might, which would be to approve the revised North Carolina aquaculture plan as submitted on July 25th, 2017. And if I could get a second, I'd like to go ahead and provide some discussion to address um, some of the concerns that were brought up by the technical committee and by the law enforcement committee. Second by Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So first of all, I just want to thank both the technical committee and the law enforcement committee for reviewing this plan. Um, once again, it is it is a third go around and I certainly appreciate you know their diligence um, and patience and certainly understand you know, the caution given that this is the first aquaculture plan under Addendum 4 that's that's being considered. Um, and, you know, in regards to some of the technical committee concerns with regard to the um, recommendation that this be, you know, a potentially approved for only one versus, versus uh, two or three years. And, you know, certainly, and I think the, the justification given the technical committee memo was that this would ensure that no one, you know, individual or operation would be harvesting the entire 200 pound quota. And um, definitely appreciate that the TC is looking out for potential future applicants, you know, to ensure some equity and distribution. But I would just note that, you know, I think that's, that's more of a, a management concern and more of a North Carolina concern. And, um, you know, when I visited the facility and, you know, discussed that should there be future applicants um, with the American Eel Farm staff, you know, they understood that decisions would need to be made on, on resource sharing and, and acknowledge this. And I think the other thing I would note is that, and I, you know, mentioned this earlier when a couple questions came up, is that any permit that we issue by rule has to be renewed on an annual basis. And so the permit that was issued for harvest this year only applied January through the end of April. 
So a permit that would be issued for, you know, this plan would only be issued for January through May of 2018 and then would have to be reviewed and renewed for 2019, you know, subject to the rules that we have on the books with regard to any convictions and future issuance of, um, of permits. So I just want to make sure the board knew that. And then um, certainly understand the technical committee's concern about the request to remove um, the statement um, in regards to, uh, I think it was the, um, the contribution, I guess, you know, I would just note that um, the applicant did not want to um, remove that statement on, uh, that was, you know, it could be argued that the harvest of 200 pounds of glass seals is limited enough to have a minimal impact on the spawning stock of American eel. And I think that was in reference to the high natural mortality of this life stage. You know, that is actually followed by a sentence that says, natural mortality is thought to be very high during the early life stages, leptocephalus, glass eel, and elver due to the high fecundity of American eel. And so that's, that's why the applicant um, elected to keep that statement in there. Um, I think, you know, with regard to the Irish eel ramp, as Jordy noted, um, you know, based on our staff's uh, review of the areas where the applicant would, would like to set, there are no places within joint and coastal waters, which are the only waters that, where this activity would be allowed that are suitable for an Irish eel ramp. My understanding from the applicant is that um, they agreed they had not scouted for any locations for this gear, but felt that um, they wanted to be able to have the option to use the gear should, uh, should there be suitable locations. And, you know, I would just note that um, one of the conditions is that uh, construction and siting of, of one of these um, Irish eel ramps would have to be approved prior to the ramp actually putting, being put in the water. Um, you know, in terms of the requirement that, that fight nets be fished every 24 hours, you know, certainly understand that there are concerns about mortality. As I've noted, there are excluded panels um, in the throat of the nets. And, you know, I don't know, it, my sense is that there's not requirements to fish nets um, once every 24 hours in the jurisdictions where there are commercial glass seal fisheries. I understand South Carolina might be considering something like that. Um, in the future and understand that that was meant to to ensure that there would not be additional mortality of glass eels. I guess I would just note that the applicant was only able to harvest a quarter pound of eels, you know, this year with the efforts that, that went on. Um, and given that the applicant is looking to set nets that are three and a half hours away from the facility, you know, we certainly have concerns regarding inclement weather that would not allow for harvesters to meet this requirement just given the distance from the facility you know, as, as Jordy noted, this was brought up during the technical committee call and that, you know, inclement weather certainly was um, a challenge. And, I, you know, I guess I would also note that it is in the applicant's best interest to ensure that, you know, once the run begins and harvest begins, that they harvest any available glass eels as quickly as possible and get all those eels back to the facility as quickly as possible, particularly since, any glass eels that are harvested, if there's any mortality of those eels once harvested, that counts against the 200 pound um, quota. And, you know, once the run starts, I doubt they'll be leaving the site until they've harvested all the eels that, that they can. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the providing data and information to calculate the catch per unit effort, you know, we've We've explained the importance of this information. You know, this information is, is important, you know, not only for um, future information on glass eel abundance in North Carolina, but we also try to explain the importance of this to the applicant in terms of being able to locate, you know, sites that are, that are productive. And then um, just to address a few of the law enforcement committee concerns, first of all, I wanted to give a huge shout out to um, both Mark and Kirby for getting the law enforcement committee together on such short, short notice, you know, that was um, very much appreciated. And for the law enforcement committee's thoughtful discussion and for their um, deference to the acknowledgement of, you know, our enforcement staff's assessment of their ability to enforce the conditions of the plan. And I think, you know, in terms of the concerns with regard to removal of, of 
you know, oversight conditions. You know, I think as with any new endeavor, there is, whether it's research or otherwise, there is always something of a shakedown period in your, your initial season. And after reviewing the implementation of this year's plan, you know, we agreed with the applicant that some of these conditions were, um, were duplicative. And, you know, so requiring the applicant to provide description and registration of the boat and description and registration or um, and license plate of the vehicle and the names of the individuals that would be involved daily rather than once prior to the season, you know, doesn't really provide Marine Patrol with any additional enforcement capability. You know, if any of those items change and they are not reported, that's a permit violation. So, um, you know, additionally, if Marine Patrol goes to a site and the license plate of the vehicle does not match the information that was provided previously, then that is a permit violation. Um, you know, and additionally requiring the applicant to call in the total harvest of eels prior to leaving the last harvest site and then also requiring the applicant to again report that information to the eel biologist the next day I think is also duplicative. Uh, you know, the applicant is still required to call in daily with the site, the landing site, the site from which they will be leaving and returning to. Um, you know, the total number of pieces of gears that would be used. And so failure to return to that site or to report a change in site is a permit violation. Um, you know, they're still required to provide GPS coordinates for all the gear and any failure to report changes in the locations of those gear is a permit violation. So, um, you know, and I guess in returns to, in um, regards to the expansion of effort, you know, the applicant is still bound by the 200 the 200 pound limit with regard to harvest. You know, certainly the applicant encountered some challenges, uh, you know, with equipment damage this year. And so having the permit apply or allowing for up to three harvesters on the permit also would allow them to um, continue to operate even if uh, one set of equipment was, was damaged, um, their boat and trailer was actually run into earlier this year. So they were unable to operate um, for some period of time. Um, I think I've already noted just in terms of the, the length of time that the gear is in the water and the changes with regard to how the gear would be fished. Um, I've addressed that earlier. Um, and, you know, I guess I would just emphasize that our Marine Patrol staff has no concerns about their ability to meticulously enforce, you know, the permit conditions as well as all existing rules that apply to the applicant. And their concern is really about, you know, individuals who are not permitted and who might be engaged in, uh, you know, illegal activities. So, and I, I think, you know, I just, I think many of the requirements that we're placing on this applicant, um, you know, are not necessarily requirements for, um, Harvest, commercial harvesters of glass eels and, and other locations. Um, and I think, you know, we need to be very aware of what is being asked of this applicant versus, you know, the requirements of permitted harvesters in other states. And I think the other thing, um, you know, I certainly appreciate the concern that this board, that the technical committee and the law enforcement committee have expressed and understandably so, you know, given that this is the first proposal. Um, you know, my sense is that, you know, as Mr. Kelleher mentioned, there's likely to be interested parties from other jurisdictions that may come forward. And so I think we need to be really attentive to um, what is being required of this applicant and future applicants and just take great care in ensuring that we're consistent in how we consider those proposals. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence in allowing me to uh, go on like this. Thank you, Dr. Duvall. Before I open it up, could you just elaborate a little bit more? Um, Addendum 4, of course, states that the state can objectively show the harvest will occur from a watershed that minimally contributes to the spawning stock of American eel. Of course, this is not defined in the addendum, and I'm sure by expanding the area where the farm can harvest their glass eels, they're going to be hitting a lot more watersheds. Is the position more that the 200 pounds is a minimal uh, effect on eels in North Carolina, given the huge expanse that he's now going to be fishing from, or is he going to be limited in all those different watersheds to certain bodies uh, or certain parts of the watershed. Thanks. More the former, Mr. Chairman, that, you know, just, um, you know, given the fact that 200 pounds is, you know, an overall limit and, and given um, 
the fact that the glass eel population is a panmictic population that I don't believe there's information at this time indicating that, you know, as eels come into fresh, you know, migrate into fresh water, as the glass eels migrate into fresh water, that there's any preference for any one location versus another up and down the coast. Thank you. Uh, further discussion on this matter? Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Michelle, just in re relation to the violations, whatever, I think, um, I guess the concern that, you know, maybe I have and some other people have is that when you're starting out a pilot program, you know, you, we kind of sit down with applicants and similar things and explain to them how they have to be squeaky clean and seeing the number of violations maybe, you know, in the first year. Now, understanding growing pains, but still it raises a concern. So uh, I support this. Um, however, I think um, what would be helpful, maybe following along with Maine's two-strike rule, is that if we could maybe after, it's a multi-year plan, so maybe after the first year, sort of have an update on the, uh, you know, how, how well the applicant's doing in the second year. So maybe this was just growing pains and not somebody who's not doing everything he needs to make sure he's not violating the permit. Dr. Duvall. And Jim, I think we'd be happy to provide, you know, an update after you know, seeing how things go in the 2018 season, you know, similar to um, what was provided to the technical committee in terms of how harvest went, how, you know, any, any violations are going. I will note that, you know, the applicant is not a commercial fisherman by training by any means, so certainly growing pains have played into this. Thanks. Dan McKiernan. Yeah, I'm, thank you. I'm going to channel my inner Tom Fody. And um, recall that four years ago, uh, I recall the debate when we established this uh, section of the management plan, and I recall Lewis Daniel uh, making a very impassioned plea about, uh, you know, uh, glass eels and uh, being eaten by bluegills, and, and there was um, some watersheds that clearly you could just clean them out, and, it weren't, you know, you, you weren't going to do any damage to the, the overall stock. So I'm concerned that if this is the first one we're going to do uh, successfully, but we've, we're losing the sort of the, the criteria of, of assessing that the watersheds are minimally contributing. And so I always sent, uh, the sense I got was that there was going to be a, a qualifying uh, criteria saying we're not going to take them from the productive watersheds, but you can take them from the unproductive watersheds. And I think we've lost that if, if this is how I understand it. Thanks, Dan. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think North Carolina has done a great job um, getting their arms around this uh, issue and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, having it go smoothly as it can, so they, they need to be applauded for that. Um, I guess where they are permitting annually uh, where, and where this is new and changing uh, for the Commission and where there were violations last year, I guess I'd like to see us go to one year as opposed to two years. So uh, other than that, I certainly can support this, but uh, I'd like to see that change. Further comments? Would you like to amend the motion, Richie? I'm sorry, Eric. That's okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think we should go with the two-year time frame only because I think North Carolina's got a pretty good handle on it. And since they only issue their, their own permit for a year, uh, the yield farm's got a lot at stake. Uh, I really don't want to have this conversation next year. And I think the state of North Carolina is more than capable of deciding whether or not it's going to be a year or two years. So I think we should go for the two-year program. Thank you. Further discussion? Jim Gilmore. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of the two years also, but then just let me clarify something. If, you know, my suggestion to bring this up after the first year before the board again, we would have the opportunity if it turns out that we're having more violations that we could reconsider the plan, you know, uh, um, you know, the terms at that point, I'm assuming. Is that everybody's understanding? Thanks. Uh, Pat Keller. Oh, just to air, uh, echo Eric and, um, and Jim's comments, I think two years is, is adequate. Um, I, I would, uh, and 
I, I would think, though, a very quick check-in after the first year would be uh, would be advisable, not to the uh, extent that we've just gone through here in, in, in the last time that this was debated here at this board. I, I also, I personally think the issues associated with the enforcement actions against this individual really become a state issue. Um, I, I understand that this is a uh, an issue associated with. Um, uh, a, a, an experiment, if you will, associated with um, the harvest of, of 200 pounds of, of elvers. But after talking with Dr. Duvall, it's obvious by the amount of enforcement activity associated with this individual that they're keeping a real close eye on him. So uh, I'm perfectly comfortable with, uh, with North Carolina taking the appropriate action um, if, uh, if we see continued violations. Thanks, Pat. Are there? Uh, oh, Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been convinced uh, uh, from the other commissioner's input that uh, two years uh, does work. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would like to hear that Jim's comment is doable, that if there were issues that we do have the ability to reconsider if we issue a two-year. Kirby, you want to address that? Can the board address? Could the board reconsider this in a year if there were problems? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it poses a question in terms of um, the motion on the board now. I mean, it's it's you're approving right now. The plan is submitted, so the plan is submitted is for a two-year period. Um, I, I'm not sure of how that would work next year if the board opted to decide to not allow it moving forward, um, but maybe Bob or Tony could, could provide clarity. Bob? Yeah, the FMP is silent on, on, those kind of, on, the, on that level of detail. So I think if the discussion around the table is that this is a two-year approval, however, there's going to be a quick review, as Pat Keller put it, in, you know, after the first year, and then the board um, can decide to you know, revoke this. You know, if, if the board takes action, or let me back up. The board would need to take action to revoke the second year. If the board takes no action, the second year occurs. And if everyone around the table is comfortable with that approach and there's no, no objection to that approach, that's what the record will show. And I think that's, that's in bounds and, and uh, you know, definitely within the purview of the board. Dr. Duvall, would you like to comment on that also? Yeah, just thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one you know, quick follow-up that, you know, as I noted, permits are issued only for a year. This permit would only be issued effective January through May, the harvest period. And, you know, by rule, if, if convictions occurred that um, met the penalty schedule within our rules, then we would not be allowed to reissue a permit. So. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll read the motion into the record. Move to approve the revised North Carolina Aquaculture Plan as submitted on July 25th, 2017. Motion by Dr. Duvall, seconded by Mr. Gilmore. Um, is there any objection to this motion? Seeing no objections, the motion is approved by unanimous consent. Okay, that settles agenda item number four. Now we're going to move on to agenda item five, which uh, Kirby's going to address the 2016 yellow eel landings overage and the coastwide cap. This is something that affects all our states. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's just give a minute to get the motion off the board and the presentation up. All right. So um, I'm going to walk through. Uh, Pretty much the memo that I, I sent to the board, of, uh, or included in the meeting material, excuse me, uh, laying out Addendum 4's provisions, um, the preliminary 2016 yellow eel landings, uh, next steps, and I'll take any questions that board members have. So uh, Addendum 4 established a coastwide cap of 907,671 uh, pounds coastwide. Uh, so based on uh, average landings from 1998 to 2010, that's what the, the, 
the, the full coast is evaluated against. Um, the addendum laid out that if that cap was exceeded, uh, the accountability measure works in that there's a two there's two possible management triggers. So if the coastwide cap is exceeded by more than 10% in a given year, so approximately 998,000 um, pounds, then state by state quotas would be triggered. The other management trigger would be if the coastwide cap is exceeded for two consecutive years, regardless of whether it's a pound or 700 pounds or 1,000 pounds, um, then state by state quotas are implemented. So under the state by state quota system, the new coastwide quota would be 907,669 pounds. And the way it would work with state by state quotas is that if there was uh, a state quota overage in a given year, the following year there would be a pound for pound payback. Um, it should be also noted that under this uh, provision in the addendum, quota transfers are allowed, uh, but they must be submitted to uh, the commission uh, executive director and, and staff. Um, so I've got up here on the board now what the the state by state quotas would be, and these were laid out in addendum uh, f uh, four, and they're included in the back part of the addendum. And there's a number of uh, subsequent or columns next to it that lay out how those quotas were derived, and I can um, try to answer those if people have questions. But as many of you probably remember, it was a uh, uh, a number of averaging across years and redistribution of, of quota depending on um, how states had performed during those periods. So in the, the memo that I included in meeting materials, I laid out what the coastwide total was, but I didn't include information on the state-by-state -state landings for 2016. On the screen now, I have what the state-by-state -state landings are, and I just want to reiterate again that these are preliminary landings. And so what that means is that uh, they're subject to change. They may go up, they may go down from here, um, but it, it's important to know that they're not going to likely stay these numbers. And ACCSP staff is here uh, at the meeting today um, and, and happy to answer further questions people have about the timing of when data will be available later this year. Um, but, but generally speaking, uh, you know, this information is fluid until it's final. And so uh, later this year it will become final. So in terms of next steps, as I said, 2016 landings will be finalized later this fall. And in terms of looking towards next year, you know, we've got one year right now based on preliminary data that indicates that we're at kind of 1A of a two-part management trigger. So if 2017 landings, which would be reported out next spring, indicate that the coastwide cap has been exceeded again, whether by a pound or more, uh, then state-by-state state, uh, quotas would be implemented or at least triggered by the addendum for provisions. Um, it's important to know that determination of whether state-by-state state quotas um, are to be implemented would be done at that time. So we would be waiting until some point in the spring for that determination. It wouldn't be something we would know on January 1st of 2018. Um, and again, those numbers would still be preliminary. So in terms of those numbers possibly changing, like we're in the situation right now, uh, we might not know for sure whether the overage, depending on if there was one, uh, if it, the extent of it, we wouldn't know until the fall of 2018. So with that, I'll take any questions if folks have regarding preliminary uh, data for 2016 and the addendums provisions. Do we have any questions for Kirby on this issue? Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, just a great reluctance on this preliminary data. Um, I know in Virginia there have been some occasions, I think it's improved, where we've had some double counting. And I can see where, depending on how narrow an overage would be and the way you expressed it in the document, or the way it was expressed in the document, the way you expressed it was just one pound would do it. So we're sitting here in August, and we don't have final data, but in May of 2018, we'll have preliminary data. Do we have any idea as to 
what the process would be if we um, had some sort of lag built into this when we really had final data and could then take the next step forward so that's that's a question I guess maybe you thought about but uh, kind of curious as to the answer especially given all the states that don't have the ability to enact regulations um, quickly you know that could be something that even in May um, that certainly would allow time there but not if it's just preliminary data so yeah, thanks, Rob. That's a, that's a good question and definitely um, one that I have thought about and struggle with. But basically, you know, this board can decide if they want to deviate from the addendum for provisions um, and try to build in some kind of delay in implementation of state-by-state -state quotas. That, that, that is a possibility, but that would require board action um, because as you point I believe it would require an addendum. Thanks, Kirby. Pat, and then Lynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, we're in this, I think Rob O'Reilly has kind of brought up the, kind of the crux of this problem. We're kind of, we're, we're trying to determine how and when this is all gonna happen. The timing of the implementation of, uh, of rules associated with uh, implementation of possible state-by-state -state quotas. Um, under other business, I was going to bring forward the issue of, of Maine's Elver quota as well. Um, we've just completed the three-year uh, the three-year quota um, allocation for the state of Maine regarding glass eels. Um, we'd like to see uh, a review of that and I'm wondering mr. chairman if it may be a better option to formalize a, um, a, a subcommittee for eels to look at both yellow eel and glass eels to make a recommendation to this board at a future meeting on um, really what the best path forward would be including deviation from this addendum in the beginning of a uh, of a new addendum I think that's a Excellent idea, Pat. I think at this point, though, um, why don't we save that for other business? Because I agree with you that, first of all, we will have to address Maine's glass eel uh, quota for 2018 under other business because the addendum only goes through 2017. And the addendum does state that for the board can approve Maine getting the same quota for 2018, but for any change in your quota, we'd have to go to addendum. So there's one impetus for a new addendum, and of course this yellow eel cap, which I will go out on a limb and say no state is looking forward to uh, putting yellow eel quotas into place. So I think uh, we've got uh, those to look at. As far as a possible action on this, I guess we were thinking in terms of, I know Lynn, you had some ideas on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, I, I completely agree with Mr. Kelleher and the issues that we have with the timing of this harvest. If we're in May of 2018 and we are under uh, the cap for the, what happens if five pounds come in in, in July? Does that mean that we're going to have to go back and, and implement? So, I th and the idea of implementing a state-by-state -state quota in the middle of a fishing season I don't, not every state can do it, and it just it causes chaos on the ground. So um, I, I, I had intended to make a motion to delay implementation t until January 1st, 2019, um, if we find ourselves over for 2017, but it sounds like there may be a more comprehensive way to look at this and maybe look at what we can do th through a subcommittee to um, to, to deal with this state-by-state -state quota issue. So I'll defer till we get to that conversation. Thanks, Lynn. Roy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note for the record that um, Delaware lacks the regulatory authority to impose a quota. Uh, and so if a quota becomes necessary, if the trigger is pulled, then, then that would require enabling legislation. And we all know that that can be a uncertain process. Thank you. Roy, I need to correct you there. The legislation that brought us back into compliance, um, actually the legislature left it up to themselves to determine how we would 
meet our eel quota, how that would be divvied up. That would be an interesting process, I agree, but it, it was addressed when we came back into compliance. Thank you for that correction. I think at this time, um, oh, Jim Gilmore. Uh, yeah, I just want to add to, to uh, Pat's suggestion on the, uh, you know, that subcommittee, whatever. Um, I think it would be also uh, important to have a discussion about how the, um, we're going to be doing transfers, uh, if we got to that, how that would all work, because there's, um, it's a little unclear to me how, and again, if we get into the situation, the other quota transfer places, we get this sort of, for lack of a better term, a derby to get to the state that has the most whatever. So, and I think some suggestions about having maybe the commission um, mediate that might be a good idea. But anyway, uh, just a little bit more discussion about how that would occur if we did get into quota management would be helpful. Thanks. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of interest in the board. Before Addendum 4, the board put together a working group to develop Addendum 4, which was there to develop both the glass eel, the yellow eel, uh, quotas, the uh, uh, aquaculture plans, etc. Uh, perhaps this would be the time for a motion for the board to put together another working group to. Oh, let's see. okay, Tony, would you like to address? John, I don't think you need a motion to put together the working group, and I, I think it's clear around the table that that's the interest of this board. And what we can do is have the working group first talk about. If there's ways possibly outside of an addendum process to address uh, the immediate need of dealing with the quotas, if we do go over in 2017 to trigger the state-by-state -state quotas, and we can do that hopefully before the annual meeting. And then the second um, thing that that working group would be charged to do, which we have promised we would do what, after the results of the assessment came back, is to relook at the state-by-state -state quotas for yellow eel, as well as Kirby mentioning before, or maybe it was Pat or you, that we are obligated to look at the main um, yellow, uh, the main Elver quota, because that runs out for um, next year. So we right, will need but to that, that. that will require an addendum at that point. Um, we'll look into seeing what we are required to do for Maine. Well, it says in the addend this de addendum yeah. that if we're to change the Maine glass yield yeah. quota, we need a new addendum. Yeah. So we would need to go to an addendum at that point? Most likely. Lynn? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on the process. So right now under Addendum 4, if we exceed in 2017, I think what the addendum says is we go to automatic state-by-state -state quotas. And I, I'm not sure what automatic means, if that means the, in the same year or if that could mean 2019. I, so if we need an addendum to change that, and we put together a working group to develop a strategy, an addendum, and that working group comes back in, at the annual meeting, would an addendum, can we finalize an addendum to get us out of state-by-state -state quota implementation in 2018 in time? That's my, if that makes sense. Tony? Lynn, I think what we would do is explore all of our options and what is the fastest way to get to a solution. Um, I need to read up on the exact provisions of what types of emergency actions we could take, potentially if um, any of the inabilities of states to be able to respond fast enough could, um, could be uh, justified as an emergency action or not, um, and also look at um, sort of how we went through and implemented the addendum to see if for example, your idea of doing a motion to delay that until later is something that we could do within the rules of the charter and the plan. Um, so we just want to be able to look into what all of our options are and then bring that back to the board. We could fast track an addendum um, where we would meet via conference call um, to get something done so it would be done before the end of the year. Um, it would probably mean limited public hearings. It would only be out for 30 days, that type of um, methodology to do the addendum, but um, we would just want to look at what all of our options are and bring that back to the board at the annual meeting. So Tony, we don't need 
a motion, but at this point, is it the board's uh, desire to reconstitute a working group on eels to explore possibilities for addressing the coastwide cap, addressing the glass eel quota, addressing aquaculture, all these items? Is there any objection to doing so? Seeing none, let's form another working group then to address these issues. And uh, as long as we're discussing these issues, Pat, would you like to make a motion about Maine's glass eel quota for 2018 under addendum four? Uh, Maine can request to have the same quota for 2018 as they had for these past three years. Well, Mr. Chairman, I was prepared to do that, but based on Tony's comments and the potential fast tracking an, an addendum in the future, I'm wondering if we shouldn't hold off on that motion until the annual meeting. That's fine. I, it, as long as that will give Maine, that should still give Maine time to, well, you'd have the same quote in effect for 2018. Yeah, okay. and, and even even with changes under the emergency authority right. bestowed on me by the legislature of the state of Maine, I could implement. Excellent. Thanks, Pat. Do we have any further discussion of the uh, of this coastwide cap and overage? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to agenda item six, which is consider the 2016 American Eel FMP review and state compliance. And Kirby will take that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just getting the presentation up real quick. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through uh, status of the fishery commercial. As you are all aware, there's um, recreational measures in place, but not much of a recreational fishery. The uh, Stock status, state compliance with the FMP, highlight any changes uh, from uh, 2014 to 2015, and go through the plan review team's recommendations. So uh, state reported landings of yellow silver eels were uh, 1,052,514 pounds in 2014 and 865,070 pounds in 2015. So that uh, amounts to an 18% decrease from 2014 to 2015. Maryland and Virginia account for 66% of that coastwide harvest. Uh, landings of glass eel were reported from Maine and South Carolina. In 2014, they were over uh, 12,000 pounds. Um, in 2015, uh, they were down to 5,442 pounds. Uh, regarding the recreational fishery, as of 2009, recreational data is no longer provided for American eel in the compliance reports. Uh, this is a result of the unreliable design of MRIP to focus on active fishing sites uh, along the coast and estuarine areas and the uh, high associated uh, proportion standard error associated with those estimates. So as you're all aware, we had a stock assessment completed in 2012. Uh, there is no change to that um, uh, as of yet. The stock status remains depleted. Uh, we've in turn had two addenda that came out of that uh, stock assessment um, or in response to it, addendum three and addendum four. And as you all are aware, we will be getting a, an assessment update um, presented to the board and it will be completed later this fall. So uh, regarding the, the, the plans, requirements, uh, glass eel fishery regulations, all states must implement a young of year survey and all states must maintain regulations. Those were set in place in 2000 and the max, uh, maximum amount of uh, pigmented eels is 25 per pound of glass eel using a uh, one eighth mesh to grade eels. Maine self-imposed an involuntary quota in uh, 2014 of 11,479 pounds. That was further adjusted through addendum um, four. Regarding uh, those measures that are in place, uh, harvest of glass eels, as this board is probably aware, uh, took place in Florida in 2013 and 2014. Um, and following that, uh, Reporting out the board exempted implementation of regs until Florida demonstrated a fishery existed. Uh, in turn, Florida in 2015 moved to uh, close that loophole and reduce, or excuse me, eliminate glass seal harvest by implementing a nine inch minimum size. 
Regarding the yellow eel regulations for both commercial and recreational, um, it was an increase to a minimum size of nine inches and gear specifications were half inch by half inch um, mesh size for yellow eel pots and an allowance of a four by four inch escape panel on the mesh. Recreational bag limit is, 40, is 25 um, eels per bag per day per angler and crew and captains are allowed 50 uh, fish possession limit. Um, regarding those, uh, Connecticut implemented uh, the escape panels as a component of those regulations and that was done in October of 2015. Regarding silver eel regulations, there's a seasonal closure from September 1st through December 31st. There's no take except for baited pots and traps and spears. Um, and there was a one-year exemption for the Weirish uh, fishery in Delaware River and its tributaries in New York. Um, in terms of the PRT's review of those regulations, Florida uh, does, does not prohibit pound nets from September 1st through December 31st, but has no active fishery for silver eels over the last 10 to 15 years. Other measures, there's a uh, requirement to have trip level reporting by both harvester and dealers at least monthly. And um, New Hampshire and, and New Jersey do not have dealer reporting for eels, but harvester reports um, some of the information, harvesters report some of the information on dealers. Delaware Potomac River Fisheries Commission in Florida do not have dealer reporting for eels. And then regarding de minimis requests, the FMP stipulates that states may apply for de minimis for each of the life stages for the, if the, for the preceding two years, the average commercial landings constituted less than 1% of the coastwide um, commercial landings for that life stage. So New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, South Carolina, Georgia, all requested de minimis status for their yellow eel fishery. Um, all those states that applied for yellow eel meet the de minimis status requirement um, and that they were less than 1% of the previous year's landings. Um, South Carolina put in a request for de minimis status for their glass eel fishery but do not meet that one, um, less than 1% of uh, coastwide landings criteria. So last, the plan review team recommendations. The plan review team uh, considered state compliance and mentioned the following. Uh, they wanted to see more highlighted trends in the state compliance reports um, and for states to provide estimates of harvest uh, regarding those that are going to food and to bait. Uh, some states do it better than others. Um, and also asked for states to provide more information regarding law enforcement agencies' efforts to collect uh, information on illegal or undocumented uh, fisheries for eel in their states. Um, and then for states to collect harvest data from those that are um, uh, harvesting eels primarily for personal use. So the plan re review team recommends that the board approve de minimis status requests for New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, South Carolina, and Georgia for their yellow eel fisheries. And I'll take any questions if uh, commissioners have it. Thank you. Any questions for Kirby on this? Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Kirby. Do you have a table of the state-specific landings and even relative to the looming quotas, the state-specific quotas that may come to uh, bear fruit soon? Uh, yes, yeah, so you're asking about a comparison of state landings in 2015 relative to state potential quotas or 2016 landings relative to potential uh, state quotas? Well, both would be good, but the reason I brought it up, I want to make sure that uh, folks aren't going to line up for transfers when we get to that system of quotas because you had you Maryland week, yeah. and Virginia <coughs> as 56 percent of the total. And it's been a long time since Virginia's had a fishery like that. Um, and by the time there is a quota, which I've expressed a little concern before, instead of about 98,000 pounds, by the third iteration of the working group, um, just bringing it up, we're down to 78,000 pounds. So Virginia has been relatively small, um, you know, maybe 9%, something like that. And with the 78,000, it'll be about 8%, so a little over 8%. So it just might be good at some point since there will be a working group. 
um, unless the rules change a little bit, you know, we should look forward to a quote at some time. And when we do, I think everyone should kind of get an idea of, you know, where the uh, fishery is on a state-specific basis. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Dr. Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just um, in, in regards to the uh, FMP review, there's um, under section four the status of research and monitoring in it. There's a statement in there that, that says that um, Pennsylvania, D.C., North Carolina, and Georgia do not have young of the year surveys, but instead have yellow eel surveys. And we do not have a yellow eel survey in North Carolina. We do have a young of the year survey. It's the Beaufort Bridge Net survey, I believe. Um, the board approved the use of that as our young of the year survey back in 2009. So that is provided. So I just want to make that correction. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none. Can we get a motion to uh, approve the FMP review and state compliance reports? The motion is coming. Emerson is second. Emerson Hasbrook second this motion. Any discussion of the motion? Sharif? I just, I, I believe I have to read it <laughs> in order to have it a, a clear motion. Sure. Thank you. Uh, move to approve the 2016 Fishery Management Plan review of the 2000 and did I say that right? Approve the 2016 FMP review of the 2015 fishing year and approve de minimis requests for New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, Georgia for yellow eel. Dr. Rhodes? Um, I believe South Carolina was in the yellow eel de minimis also. Will you accept that addition? Yes, I'll accept that addition. Thank you. Okay. What about, was South Carolina also yep. in the for glass eel? They weren't, they didn't meet it. Okay, they didn't meet that. Okay. Okay, so the revised motion is move to approve the 2016 FMP review of the 2015 fishing year and approve de minimis request for New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, South Carolina, and Georgia for yellow eel. And are there any objections to this motion? Seeing none, it is approved. Kirby. Um, just want to turn it over to Kirby about the plan review team. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've been moving through this board so uh, quickly this morning and well that I forgot to note that we have a pretty small plan review team right now, uh, which is comprised of basically me and one or two other staffers. So it would be great if the states could submit um, nominations or at least somebody to take part in that plan review team as well. Um, you know, reviewing these compliance reports annually is a little bit of a lift, so we would appreciate the states putting forward somebody, and that can just be done through email. Sending that to me afterwards would be great. Thanks, Kirby. I'm sure he'll be flooded with volunteers. Uh, do you have a question, Roy? Okay, that is, should do it for that agenda item. We have uh, several other business items. And uh, let me go back to public comment. Pat, is your aquaculture person here? Okay, well, we can put that on, on hold. Um, let's see, what else did we have here? Oh, well, I guess not all that much, really. Um, we did have uh, a uh, interest from I've been told the Minister of Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans, or the Minister, rather, of the 
Canadian De Department of Fisheries and Oceans, would like to address the board, the eel board at the uh, annual meeting in Norfolk. Uh, they are very interested in further cooperation on eel issues, and in particular, um, Canada is moving ahead with uh, some fairly large-scale efforts in eel aquaculture, and I believe he would like to talk about that. A former member of this board, Mitch Feigenbaum, is heavily involved in the Canadian aquaculture effort. So uh, I guess that's more of just an information item there. Uh, is the board amenable to inviting the Canadian Minister of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to our annual meeting? Should he be able to make it? Seeing no objections, I'll take that as a yes. And uh, is there any other business to come before the board? Oh, Roy. Thank you, John. Regarding an issue I brought up earlier with regard to Delaware's quota system, I'd like to read directly from Chapter 18 of 7 Delaware Code. It says, any such management's, quota management system required by the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission shall be implemented through legislative action. Thank you. Okay, I thought they were, I stand corrected then. Um, anything else? Seeing no other items, we are adjourned. We will start the Menhaden board um, in 15 minutes, so that is 11.10.